Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, have a word of encouragement for you today. Anybody ready to be encouraged a little bit by God's word? Man, there is so much bad news out there. I want to give you some hope this morning. Here, here's the reality. You have a calling on your life. Do you realize that? I'm going to say it again. Do you realize that you have a calling on your life? You have an ability to be able to make an impact. God would not have created you unless it was for a reason. And I know you're going, well, my mom and my dad maybe meant to or maybe didn't mean to. Or Can I just tell you what? God put a soul and a purpose and a calling in your life and not one of the time has that ever been done on accident. There is no such thing as an accident. There is a calling on each and every single person in this room. And in fact, on this globe, if you would just step into that. And what can take place sometimes is you look at the magnitude of all of the problems that are out there in the world and you look at who you feel like you may or may not be and you might feel really small compared to the large obstacles that our globe faces. And the truth is, is that God has called you and equipped you to do some pretty remarkable things. Software date update available. We are going to say, remind me later. Look at that. We can go back to it. So if you were to try to tackle some of the world's greatest problems, uh, it would be done through the airplane mask approach. And I know that everybody is really, really happy to hear about masks, aren't you? Like, I'm not talking about the mask that the people wore in their car by themselves in 2020, which I still don't understand. Seriously, I was driving down South Laburnum. I saw somebody wearing a mask by themselves in their vehicle this week. And I'm just, uh, uh, woo, all right, I'm just going to leave that right there. But dang, okay. So if you've been on an airplane, um, you know how the, they have the masks that drop down. Well, hopefully you haven't seen one, but if they, they explain to you if there's an incident that happens, the masks drop down and they explain to you if you have little ones, put your mask on first because if you're gonna tackle the problems that your kids might have, you need to make sure that you're healthy first and so put your own mask on and then put theirs on. That's the whole concept here. If you wanna make a massive impact in this world, you need to make sure that you are in the right space. In 2014, uh, Admiral McRaven gave perhaps one of the greatest commencement speeches in the history of college commencement speeches. It was to the University of Texas, and it's referred to as the Make Your Bed speech. Have any of you all heard that one before? If you have not heard that, just do yourself a favor, Google it. We got people clapping for it in here right now. So uh, Google it, it's absolutely incredible. But the idea is, if you want to have significant impact, you need to start with these smaller things. If you can make your bed, you already have one win and you can stack win upon win upon win upon win and through a long period of consistency, make a pretty tremendous impact. And we're gonna look at some of the fundamentals right now of our faith in the book of Romans. So we've been talking about the fact that Jesus is the answer to absolutely every problem we have, that, that man is sinful, man has issues, but Jesus wins. Amen? And so as we look at the goodness of God, it eventually might lead you to a question. And this is the question that Paul is going to tackle in Romans chapter 6 is, is God too gracious? Have you ever been around somebody that's just way too generous? Like you're out with your friends and they pick up the tab for everybody and you're like, man, you didn't really need to do that. And they just are always that kind of person, just a super generous person. Have you ever thought about the magnitude of your sin and is God being too gracious to forgive? And that's the concept that's hit here in Romans chapter six. So starting in verse one, it says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound. By no means, how can we who die to sin still live in it? And this uh, kind of takes me back to this moment I had with uh, my brother in the year 2000. I think like half of our church wasn't born yet, um, but that's okay. Uh, especially uh, in Rise Kids, which is packed out right now, um, which, hey, for the record, we have people with well, a lot of babies, not just myself and my wife, but we have so many kids here. Uh, if you feel a calling on your life to serve in kids ministry, come on. We need some more people to serve back in the kids area. And uh, this is not in my notes, but I'm just going to hit on it because somebody's excited over here. So uh, 
you realize it's a blessing to have a church where one out of every three people is under the age of fifth grade. Like that is a really, really awesome thing. So many churches are praying for the next generation. We have them here. It would be incredible if some godly men and women would step up to the plate to be able to help out and serve in that area. Uh, it takes like 30 volunteers a month to be able to pull that off. And so if you feel that uh, on your heart um, or I'm guilting you and it's not in your heart, it's in your conscience, whatever, I uh, would love for you to do that. All right, back to the year 2000. Uh, my brother and I were on a trip to Aspen, Colorado. My dad had a business function there and and he would bring us along with his business functions all the time. And so uh, I was in high school at the time. My brother was in college and it was in the summer. And so all of the ski slopes were uh, hiking trails. And so what you would normally do is hop on like the gondola and go up to the top and then you would hike down the trail. The problem was is that it cost money to ride up. And so my brother and I were like, well, why don't we hike up and then we'll take it down. And so we battled all of the altitude sickness and all of that stuff. And we made it all the way up to the top. And at the very, very top, there was an all-you-can-eat restaurant. Anybody a fan of that? Okay. So um, I'm just going to let you know, yardly men can pack away groceries. It's just a thing we do really, really well at. And so we started the hike around like 7 in the morning. And we got up there, you know, maybe 10, 30, 11 or so. And we started the all-you-can-eat buffet kind of in that brunch moment. And so we hit a little bit of breakfast and then it transitioned to lunch. And uh, we made it a uh, not all you can eat buffet, but an all day buffet. You know what I'm talking about? Where if you time it right, you can really, really hit that in a, in a beautiful way. It reminds me of this um, sign I saw for a, uh, a um, Chinese restaurant where it says, all you can eat buffet, not mean all day buffet. You know, come stay for hour. You eat, you go home. Okay. So there. It's times where you can take advantage of something. Like they, have you ever been a Red Robin? Anybody Red Robin fan in here? Bottomless fries? All right, can I tell you they're not bottomless, all right? There, there is a limit and they will kick you out. I may know from experience on that. But when it comes to grace, there is no limit to grace. Like all you can eat buffet, at some point you probably shouldn't. But when it comes to grace, grace is literally all you can have grace. Once you've reached what you think the end of grace is, there's more grace on top of that. And after you reach the end of that grace, there's more grace on top of that. There is grace after grace after grace. I am so thankful for sinners like me that there's never ending grace that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. So it brings me to this moment I had with a roommate when I was in college. He got saved, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I love this. He still loves Jesus now. But he, he loved Jesus but didn't fully get it because he was like, well, God forgives everything. So I can keep on doing what I've always done. If God's going to forgive me no matter what, which he will forgive you, it's like, well, I can still smoke this. I can still drink this. I can still sleep with this person. I can still do all of this stuff because God's grace covers everything. And it becomes this abundant grace movement, which has been trending through the churches for uh, a couple of decades right now, where the reality is, is that grace never, ever ends. But it says this right here, what should we continue to sin that grace may abound? What does he say? No. See, there comes a limit, not to how great God's grace is, but that in our end, we might end up abusing that grace. So what the reality is, is Jesus is savior, right? Yes, okay, I hope you know this. But Jesus is what and Savior? He is Lord and Savior. See, it's one thing for you just to say, Jesus died for my sins and has saved me. That's beautiful. But if you declare Jesus as Lord of your life, that means he is king. He is in the seat that makes all the shots. See, I am not Lord of my life. Jesus is Lord of my life. For my kids, I am not Lord of their life. Although you may feel like that sometimes, Ezra, don't laugh right now. But the reality is, is that Jesus is Lord of their life. Jesus is the king. Jesus calls all of the shots. And so the idea of this, this radical grace movement to the point where you can do whatever is just not correct. And so what takes place is sometimes people are like, okay, well, if we can't have all of this excessive grace moment, then they swing the other way to religion and legalism. How many of you grew up in a uh, traditional church background? Just Raise your hand for a second. Oh, man. This is going to be fun. I can't wait for this. All right. Y'all ever noticed that some churches and denominations, which I love churches and I love denominations, okay? You ever notice that they make up rules sometimes? And you're like, where did that come from? 
So I, uh, I went to a private Christian college that literally had a document that was dedicated to the rules we had to follow. And there's some weird ones there, okay? And so uh, just for fun, will somebody throw out a weird church rule they've heard? Girls can't wear pants. Yeah, okay. So we know that like, so dresses is the, is the option then, okay? And like, shouldn't be here. Because you know, knees, man, something about a kneecap will make a man stumble, right? You're like, what in the world is going on with that? Like, like here, we're fine here. Oh no, like this is a problem. So the issue is if you cover the entire leg, it's a problem with pants. Makes no sense to me. I guess they're helping out that one guy who like ankles are his thing. I don't know. Yeah. So women can't wear pants. Kind of weird. All right. But guys can wear kilts. I mean, dresses. I mean, no, we won't talk about, we'll leave that over there. All right. So another thing, what's another weird rule out there in church? Don't go to movies. That may sound crazy to you, but at the school I went to, rated R movies were not allowed. They were the worst thing in the world because of speech, because of content, unless it was the passion of the Christ, because it had Jesus and they didn't know what to do with it, so they gave you a pass on that. But movies were way off limits. A good one. Any, anything else? Can't listen to music. Yeah. It's secular music, right? So like, what's the difference between Jesus music and secular music? Because uh, I listen to country music and it talks about Jesus a lot in there. It also talks about whiskey a lot, but hey, we'll leave that there for a second. But music, another rule right there that if you listen to secular music, it is going to be the end of you. Somebody else have one. Dance. You cannot dance. How dare you be? Because, well, first, you know that dancing leads to babies. We all know that. And um, that uh, David, when he danced, he didn't actually dance. That was just... David gets a one-off right there. We'll ignore that whole part of the Bible. Uh, one more rule. What, what's another rule? No drums. Because if you have a beat, whew, first, all the white people will get off of it anyways. Uh, now, I see some of y'all. You're trying to clap, and it's just way off, and it's like the Lord forgives you. It's all right. But like the idea that like if it has some sort of beat, it references like tribal stuff, and then it's satanic. No, there were drums found in script. All of these rules are there to help guard people from going too far. And while I understand the heart in that, the way that you stay consistent in your faith is not by rules, but by relationship. That is the way that you keep flowing in the grace that God has, has given you. It's not out of fear that you go, oh, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. It, it's out of love is the reason why you do it. Like I think about the last uh, couple years, um, by couple, I mean, Eric and I have been together, what, 18, 19 years now. Um, that's a couple. That's, that's not a couple. That's more than that. Um, I've been faithful to her the entire time. And, and it's not because I'm afraid she would beat me up, although she probably could. Y'all know, Woo. but it's because I love her. The reason why I, I, I make sure that our relationship is in right standing is not because of fear, but it's out of love. It's the exact same thing of our relationship with Christ is that we keep walking out the way he wants us to because of love, not because of fear. So um, I had a, a really interesting uh, moment that happened at our church because you know there's this beautiful combination of grace through relationship that puts us into the right standing with God. And can we talk about the grace of God for a moment? Is anybody thankful for the grace of God for a second? So um, we had a guy, and I don't know if I've seen him here this morning or not. And if you have, um, I'm not going to call you by name, but uh, you know exactly who you are. It's really, really fun. So he came for the first time about six months ago. And uh, I, I should not say this on stage. I'm going to say it on stage. It's great. So <laughs> after the service, he's hanging out by the stairs. And it's like a new person. So I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. He's like, bro, you mm, crushed it today. And I'm like, whoa, we got kids around right here for a second. And then he said it again. And like, people are looking like you, so you notice how quiet it got in here when I just did that. I didn't even say the word, y'all. He said it full force, full octane, full send on it. And what I love about that is that the grace of God covers the things that aren't, we aren't even aware of. That in that moment, he came, he didn't even know that you shouldn't do that in church. But the grace of God is on him and is on us in every single part right there. How beautiful is it that the grace of God is on display even when we don't recognize it? But just because it's on display doesn't mean we can abuse it. Do we continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means we continue living the life that Jesus has called us to. 
Man, I've made it through two verses. I got a bunch more. Whew. All right. That's funny. <laughs> oh, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is an incredibly important doctrine. We do it so regularly here. It's beautiful. We fill up this tank. I feel like I talk about baptism all of the time um, and it's awesome. And so whenever we do baptism, which is an outward sign of an inward expression of faith, um, you know, we dip somebody down and you ever wonder what the pastor says when that happens? Like if it's some like, like mystical thing he says over the person's life when they do it. Because I remember the first time I baptized somebody, uh, I got signed up to do it because I was a new pastor on staff at a church. And I was like, what do I say when like, good luck when you bring them down and up? I, I didn't know what to say. And so I, I Googled it because that was my, my great Bible training for that moment. I was like, how do you baptize somebody in the right words to say? And it came to this moment right here found in Romans chapter six. The idea is that if we are buried there for with him, by baptism into death, that when you go down, it symbolizes the death of Christ and the death of who you used to be. But then when you come up out of the water, you are raised that you may walk in newness of life. And so whenever we do that, I say buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life because of Jesus, we can walk in the baptism and that baptism literally says goodbye to who we used to be and, go, and hello to who we are now. And it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And at that point, we begin to walk hand in hand with Jesus. So going back um, to the time when Eric and I first started dating, and this is not an Erica sermon, but I love her, so I'm gonna talk about her. Um, I remember we would, we're outdoorsy people, that's kind of our jam. And so we would go on these long walks or hikes and uh, we would hold hands, Oh, so sweet. And we would go on these walks, hours and hours, which I have no idea what we talked about for that many hours. But we went on these walks and we would hold hands. And what I learned is the more and more we did that, the more and more we grew closer together. And the more and more we grew closer together, the more and more we began to function as one. And now into our marriage life right now, we are seen before the Lord as one. I'm up here on stage, she's back in the kids area, we are still one. If I travel across the country to speak somewhere and she's here with our kids in Virginia, we are still one because there's a oneness in marriage, right? That same oneness exists between us and Christ. Jesus says, just as the Father and I are one, the same is true for us with him. And the way that you keep that going is that you make sure that you are walking hand in hand with Jesus. And I don't mean physically because he's not here, but in following the commandments that he has, spending regular time with him. And what I've seen take place in marriages is that the hand you once held early on is now the hand you're leaving behind 10 years into marriage. And in our relationship with Jesus, you start off extremely passionate, but as time goes on, it's easy to drift away from that reality and not walk in this newness of life that he has called us to do. And now we shift into the regeneration part of this. And that sounds mystical. It definitely is not. Verse five and six. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That enslaved to sin is such a trap that the enemy would love to lay onto your life, that your identity would be wrapped up in that slavery. So uh, we have people that get married a lot here at this church, um, not to different people, but a lot of young couples getting married. And um, we walk through premarital counseling with them. It's pretty intense. Um, some of you that have gone through that, you're like, yeah, that was wild. It's good for you. And so going through with it, there have been times where the bride lived a life apart from Christ earlier in her life, has gotten saved and is now on the right path, which is the goal. And as they're, they're picking out things for the wedding, I've had this question asked, is it okay for me to wear white on my wedding even though I've not saved myself for that moment? And when I hear that, number one, I'm like, wow, look at your commitment to this. But number two, I go, you've missed this verse. You see, we know that our old self was what? Crucified. 
The old self has been crucified in him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. The person that you were before Christ, that person has been crucified. That person is gone. That person is dead. You are literally a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. You are now somebody who is no longer enslaved to sin. Now, while sin may still be there, it does not mean that you are enslaved to sin. There's a big difference there. Do you remember the story of Lazarus in the New Testament? Lazarus was a guy who um, literally died. And Jesus, a couple days later, shows up and calls his name. He's like, Lazarus, come out. That's how I picture him saying that. And Lazarus comes out and he has now gone from death to life. A beautiful, beautiful thing. But he is wrapped in what? He's wrapped in grave cloths at that time. And so what Jesus says to those who are around Lazarus, Jesus says, unbind him or unwrap him. That Jesus can do this amazing thing from taking somebody from death to life, which we will celebrate, but it's the responsibility of our community, of our church family to help unbind one another and to make sure that we are no longer enslaved to sin. The reality is in Christ, you're still gonna make mistakes. Oh, I'm so glad that I don't have to be perfect. But while I don't have to be perfect, I have to be making progress. And the way that I make progress is to not be enslaved to sin. And the way I'm not enslaved to sin is to have people around me that are helping to unbind me. I need to have that in my life. For one who has died has been set free from sin. He who is free is free indeed. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Never needed again. Jesus' death was sufficient. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourself dead in sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are alive in Christ. Our sin has been completely defeated. We are a new creation in him. And so I want to make this um, hopefully very applicable for you because this is the challenge of American church or, or a challenge, and there will always be challenges. One of the challenges is that the church can grow so big that it's easy to blend in. The church can grow so big that nobody knows if you're coming and nobody knows if you're going. And you can slip in the back door and remain anonymous for years. And while that may be comfortable, the problem with that is that you lack genuine biblical connection and community. You were never designed to do life alone. You need people to do life with. And so if we are going to help unbind each other, unwrap each other, and to grow in righteousness together, we need to have some sort of mechanism in the church to be able to do that. And I will tell you, this church right now, even in its infancy stages, which it is at this moment, is on the cusp of allowing people to slip in and slip out with nobody knowing. And it's not my responsibility to make sure that every single person stays connected. It's not. I can try my best. But whose responsibility is it for your faith? Yours. It is 100% your responsibility for you to grow in faith. If you're going, man, that word just wasn't enough for me on Sunday. I'm like, of course it wasn't. My preaching's not good enough to carry you for seven days. It, it, it's not. What is good enough is God's word and you digesting it and you processing it. That's what is needed. It is your responsibility for your faith. And so here is a really, really simple way for you to be able to really kickstart that moment. And it's leading kind of where we're going in the fall. So we do a season every single year at our church called 40 Forward. It is a 40-day season. And this 40 days, we commit to prayer and to fasting. You're like, for 40 days? Yeah, it's, it's what we do. Doesn't mean that you're going to go, you know, without food for 40 days, but something's being given up and you're going to press in a little bit deeper. You probably can't do it for the rest of your life, but for a month and a half, you can press in that much. We start it at the beginning of August, August 5th, and it leads right into our church birthday. We've done it year after year after year, and it's awesome year after year after year. 
And this year, our big heartbeat on it, well, um, first, if you want to be, I'll come back to that in a second. All right. Our big heartbeat on that is that discipleship and genuine biblical community is lacking in the church at large. And while there are some in this local congregation who are experiencing it in a massive degree, there are a lot of people that are on the fringe. And so what this 40-day season does is allows us to be able to take people and bring them together for 40 days and then launch our groups in the fall. And so if you're looking for genuine biblical community, you're looking to grow in your faith, you're looking to get over the things that once were holding you up, I'm telling you, give it a shot for these 40 days. If you want to sign up for it, text 40 forward, all one word to 97,000. That will give you all the information. It's also on our website. It's in the church email. That is one of the greatest seasons we have in our church. Uh, I encourage you, um, I, I can't encourage you enough to be a part of that. Let's hit these last uh, couple verses. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on up. Two more vers verses. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. He's talking to the church at large. And what he's saying to the church this is Paul talking to you right now. He's saying, please, 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 please. Can you all, I'll even include myself in this. Can we not present ourselves as instruments for unrighteousness? Our agenda as a church, which we have an agenda unashamedly, is not unrighteousness. Our agenda is that we have been brought from death to life. See, that's the goodness of the gospel right there. The goodness of the gospel is it's not about making bad people good. It's about making dead people alive. That is what Jesus does. And so as a church, we are being brought from death to life. And now we are instruments for righteousness. My question for you is, are you functioning as you should as an instrument for righteousness? Or are you doing church as an activity rather than a calling on your life? Remember what I said at the very beginning, there is a calling on your life. And the Lord wants to use you for mighty, mighty things. And the same problem this church had back then is the same problem we face in 2024 now, that people are abusing God's grace rather than moving forward in their life. And so I would love to, to pray for you guys this morning. I would love to pray that you would walk in the freedom that God has given. Not out of religiosity, but out of a passion to connect with Jesus. And so if you could, would you stand to your feet this morning as we prepare to close out? And God, I want to pray right now that as a church and as individuals, God, we would be spurred on to righteous activity, that we would not fall into the trap of too much grace or fall into the trap of religious systems but God we would walk with you hand in hand to our full potential influencing those around us and making a difference in this world God I thank you for all that you've done and so in response to that we walk back in obedience and it's in Jesus name I pray amen